Ahoy there! Captain Benzie here, coming at you with another ship fitting guide for Eve Echoes. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at a ship that has been heavily requested on this channel, to the point of almost achieving meme status. I think, to be fair, the people who have been requesting this particular video have probably just settled on the idea that it's never going to happen, so <laughs> I'm glad to prove them wrong. Now, ultimately, this has been because, A, we've had a lot of other stuff going on recently in Eve Echoes, what with the addition of Dreadnoughts and Carriers to the game, and also because it's a battleship, and I've not been particularly comfortable flying battleships until recently when I've started flying the Typhoon 2 and the Macariel a lot more. I'm, by nature, a small ship pilot, so whilst people ask for these larger ships, and I'm happy to oblige where I can, I've never felt overly comfortable behind the pilot seat, so to speak. Here, however, I feel comfortable to now give my thoughts and opinions regarding the Hyperion. No, not that one. Or that one. We're talking about the Galente Federation Hyperion, the really cool looking battleship that you see on screen now. Now if you are enjoying this video, please let me know by hitting a like on it, subscribe to the channel for all things Eve Echoes, and please make sure that you ding that notification bell and tap all notifications so that you never miss an upload. YouTube is notoriously bad at the moment for sending out notifications to people subscribed to gaming YouTubers. I'm getting a lot of people telling me they weren't aware of videos going out, so please tap that notify on all. If you do want to go the extra mile to help support this channel as well, I have both a Patreon page that you can pledge to support at, and a Redbubble merchandise store, both linked in the description. With all that said and done then, preamble over, let's jump right into talking about the Galente Federation Hyperion Battleship. The Hyperion is a Galente Federation Tech 10 battleship, and alongside the Kaldari State Rock, the Minmatar Republic's Maelstrom, and the Amar Empire's Abaddon, it makes up the four what I would refer to as tanky Tech 10 battleships. That is to say that the Rock and the Abaddon have bonuses to their resistances, whereas the Hyperion and the Maelstrom get bonuses to their active tank. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. Now the Hyperion itself, as I've mentioned, is a pretty cool looking ship. I like how sleek and streamlined it is, and how symmetrical it is. Now I remember when the, in Eve Echoes the Hyperion looked like this. This was its default skin, the standard Galente metallic sort of green and grey coloration to it. Now obviously Netties redid all of the Tech 10 ships, and when they did so they gave all the Galente ships the Aliastra skin, this sort of slate grey and sort of ruddy brown colour scheme. And I'm actually all down with that. The Hyperion gets some really interesting skins as well. The like navy issue ones for the Galente does look pretty good on it. The Coppice Edge is a nice burnished colour scheme. The Capsular Day 1 is probably one of the most badass looking skins in the entire game, but unfortunately the two Serpentis skins are probably the least interesting of all the pirate skins. They don't actually change the ship up all that much, and they don't even change any of the, Serpent uh, the Galente Federation emblems to Serpentis ones. Like for example, on some of the other skins you'll see the Blood Raider logo, or the essential logo and things like that feature. It means they're quite disappointing skins visually, but as you'll see later on, the actual skill bonuses on them are monstrous and make the Hyperion a truly terrifying ship. The Thermomagnetic Storm as well is probably one of the most popular nano cores to put on the Hyperion, and it does look exceptionally cool. Anyway, let's have a look at the attributes and fittings then of the Hyperion. First of all, its fitting profile. It is a monstrous battleship with 8 high slots designed for large turrets, 4 mid slots, 6 low slots, 3 combat rigs and 3 engineering rigs. We've also got two drone launching tubes that can launch either small, medium or large drones, though I'm not sure why you would ever really launch large drones, as we'll see later. We have a sizable power grid output here, 11,232 megawatts, which is plenty of space to fit pretty much anything we could ever want to here on the Hyperion. You're not going to be oversizing due to how the capital modules work, and there is more than enough power grid there to comfortably fit whatever modules we're looking at fitting. Talking about comfortable space, a cargo hold of 2,025 cubic meters is nice and sizable too. The defence is where the Hyperion really begins to shine, 101,516, the majority of which is in armour and structure, but the shield is still pretty sizeable too, and it's going to take a good amount of chipping away before that 24,000 shieldy HP disappears anytime soon. 
We've also got a pretty comfortable capacitor bank here, 11,817 gigajoules as standard. This is, of course, before we start looking into things like engineering skills. And considering that the Hyperion is, of course, going to be armor tanked, and considering how capacitor friendly armor tanking is, that large capacitor bank is going to allow us to maintain capacitor stability fairly easily. Below this, though, the Hyperion becomes a pretty standard battleship. Seven maximum lock targets with a low scan resolution of 115 meters and a very large signature radius of 302.8. It's a big target, it takes a while to lock onto anything, and it's a very slow and lumbering target as well. 134 meters per second flight velocity with a very large mass, and even though the inertia modifier looks low, multiplying the mass by that inertia modifier does still give you a very cumbersome beast of a ship. If we look at the trait description though, this is where the Hyperion really becomes its absolute monster. The Advanced Battleship Command Bonus is the one I want to bring your attention to first. Now do note that these are advanced skills, and that Advanced 5 does take a lot of training. It's like 30 odd days once you have uh, Combo Omega um, and Cognitive Neuroscience 3, so this is a ship that you're going to have to dedicate yourself into flying. Um, advanced Battleship Command gives us a 7.5% increase to Armor Repairer Armor armor repair and boy it is worth going all the way up to five there. Armor repairers, specifically large armor repairers, are already the highest EHP per second based per capacitor. Um, so adding an additional 37.5% armor repairer armor repair amount to that just gives this an absolutely monstrous amount of active armor repairing tank. This thing just repairs damage like you would not believe, and it is well worth getting that advanced battleship command all the way to 5. The difference between plus 30% and plus 37.5% is notable. You will spot the difference when you're using it. The other skill then is a advanced large railgun operation, and this again you want to get all the way to 5 to make sure you're getting the full benefit of it. It's a 9% increase per level to large railgun damage, that's 45% at full training, alongside a 7.5% increase to large railgun accuracy fall off, again 37.5% at full training. Now neither of these favour particularly snub nosed railguns or rifled railguns. The accuracy fall off works well for either, and the large railgun damage is definitely, well obviously it works well for rifled railguns or for snub nosed. That said, with the armor repair at armor repair, I personally feel the Hyperion goes towards more of an up close and personal snub nosed build. I have tried this extensively with rifled railguns as well, and if you want that kind of playstyle, the Hyperion can definitely do so, and you can worry you don't have to worry too much about having hefty amount of armor repairs because of the armor repair bonus at the bottom here, um, which means you can swap out some of your low slots for extra damage or even tracking computers to give you yourself extra range. For me though, it was the brawling playstyle that absolutely stood out to me with the Hyperion, and that's what we're going to be taking a look at in the fitting guide later. Before we proceed, please do just be aware that of course I am filming this on the content creator Fulmination test server. Now what this means is that I have 555 in literally every single skill in the game. So if you're looking at the Hyperion stats on the next section, that is based on me having every single stat in the game fully maxed out. We're kind of looking at the Hyperion and its ultimate peak performance. This does include things like, for example, drone skills. You're not going to have drone skills particularly high if you're flying a Hyperion. I'm going to have these so you will see that reflected in the stats and abilities that the Hyperion has. So please do just bear that in mind as we proceed forward. As previously mentioned, after a lot of testing with the Hyperion, both with a long-ranged fit and a short-ranged fit, I've settled on going for an up-close and personal brawling build. Now, of course I have. I'm Captain Benzie, and up-close and personal is pretty much the playstyle I'm known for when it comes to these things. In fact, if you are pledged to support me on Patreon, you'll notice that there is now some rather cool up-close and personal merchandise available. Anyway, looking at the Hyperion then, the first thing that we need to really discuss is the Nano Core, and this is something I strongly recommend sorting out before we go much further. You'll notice I've gone for the Hyperion Serpentis NCO core, but either way, any of the Serpentis cores will work. What we're looking for here is the Stasis Webifier Speed Decrease stat. It's tempting to go for some of the other stats that you can get on things like the Hyperion, but because we're using snub-nosed railguns and they're actually pretty high DPS to start with, it feels like pumping additional stats into the DPS is, you know, it's tempting. 
So just to pump that number as high as you can. But the fact that we have the way to make webs super effective against targets means those snub-nosed railguns are going to apply their damage absolutely monstrously. And you'll see that if we have a look at the webs in the mid slot here, they're at a 77.1% reduction using Predator Stasis Webifiers. That's huge. And I strongly recommend going for a nano core that has that Stasis Webifier web strength bonus to it. Now, for the high slots, we've gone for a brawling build. Of course, that means large snub-nosed railguns. We've got an optimal range of 9 kilometers with an accuracy fall-off, courtesy of the ship's bonuses, of 18.56, which means that as long as we're within sort of the 15 to 20 kilometer mark, we're probably still going to be doing good damage, and that is a massive buff to the snub-nosed railguns themselves. In addition, of course, they're getting 9% uh, per level, 45% additional DPS, giving them that 298 DPS. DPS per turret and there are eight of those along the tops. Now for the mid slots of course we've got those two webs you might add in a scram in the uh, in there instead perhaps instead of one of the webs if you're really worried but I find two webs is more than enough even against elite NPCs that are using micro warp drives those two webs will slow them down to a crawl without needing to worry about a scrambler. Instead, I've gone for two of Ricolacus Large Energy Nosferatu, and having two of those fit to this ship does make us capacitor stable. It's not particularly capacitor stable, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but it's capacitor stable enough that we can have most things running for the most part and not worry about it. And since one of the things we're not really going to have running most of the time is the propulsion module, well, it means that we're actually a lot more capacitor stable than perhaps it looks on, you know, on paper here. Now, this does also have a really nice, comfortable, optimal range of 24 kilometers. We're pretty much guaranteed to be inside that at all times with the snub nose rail guns. So yeah, we're gonna be doing pretty nicely with having those. They're gonna be pretty much always at full effect. Now for the low slots, I've gone for two core C-type large armor repairers alongside two core C-type adaptive armor hardeners. The armor hardeners push our resistances all the way up and we're going to have those running at all times. And for the most part, you'll only need to have one of these C-type large armor repairers running at any one time. And thanks to that 37.5% increase there to armor repairer, armor repairer amount, these have a monstrous repair of 2,074 EHP per cycle, which is every 10.9 seconds thanks to the skills I have. That is just an insane amount of repair and one of these will keep us alive quite comfortably for m the most part in any anomaly. If things start to get hairy though we have a second one that we can activate and that, that will keep us alive quite comfortably from there. Now again the fact that we only have one of the two armor hardeners active uh, most times does mean that we are more capacitor stable again than it would suggest here because what you're seeing here on the fitting screen is based on every single one of your modules running and in an optimal position so the Nosferatu is being within optimal range etc etc and the fact that we're not going to have this micro warp drive active for the most part and we're only going to have one armor repairer means we're actually going to be a lot more capacitor stable than it would appear. That said, the final low slot that I've gone for is a C-type large capacitor battery. I tend to be a little bit more cautious, possibly even over cautious, when it comes to the capacitor on battleships. Because I think that if you are going to... Capacitor is life. I was always brought up with capacitor is life in EVE. So anything that takes me below cap stability in PvE, I tend to get a little bit worried about. And I'd rather ensure that at any time I've got more than enough juice to keep me going. As you'll see in the combat demonstration in a bit though, this may very well be overkill and it might be worth instead swapping that out for something like a magnetic field stabilizer for a bit of extra DPS or heck, even a tracking computer for a bit of extra range and tracking on those snub nosed. It's kind of up to you, go with what works. The same is true when it comes to the rigs here. I've gone for a railgun collision accelerator 3 and 2 railgun burst aerators, which is your typical maximum DPS setup and that is giving us a whopping 2000 2383.17 DPS from the turrets. Now, of course, again, this is based on sort of, you know, a slightly over heavy on the damage. You might decide that actually that third, that second burst aerator, the third combat rig, you might want to swap out for something like either a Trimark armor pump just to really make it so that every single cycle of an armor repairer is a monstrous amount of armor repairing. Or you could even go for things like an anti-explosive rig um, just to, you know, help with your resistances. The anti-explosive rig, though, feels a little bit like overkill by the time we have the two red uh, reds 
running, I would almost go for the armor pump just for the additional fun of seeing how high you can pump up the amount of repair per cycle on your armor repairers. Now for the engineering rigs, a typical setup here, a semiconductor memory cell 3, a capacitor control circuit 3 in order to stabilize our capacitor, and a targeting system subcontroller just to pull that targeting up a little bit. It's still not great, it's 194mm with full skills, with that on there, it's not great, but it's good enough. It's good enough for PvE, and if you're in a fleet for PvP, that will do quite nicely too. Although in PvP, I would probably pop on some more defensive rigs on the combat side of things. Now, this again, it's this is how I've been running it, but you might decide that actually you do want to mix things up. As I said, the capacitor battery can easily be swapped for some kind of weapon upgrade module. You can swap one of the webs for a scram, although I wouldn't really recommend that, um, and certainly the rigs can be swapped for a bit more defense if you think that's what you need. You might decide actually that you're okay with targeting taking a bit longer, and you'd rather have something like a polycarbon engine housing or even auxiliary thrusters just to get you into range with those snub-nosed railguns. That little bit faster. Heck, I have even heard of people running things like the railgun Elutrial filter or whatever it's called, the one that maxes out the range of your railguns. I really don't personally rate those, but you might decide that that little bit of extra range helps if you're going up against elites or something that happened to orbit that little bit further away. It's very much up to you. It's This is the sort of the central core fit. I do always encourage you to sort of try these things out, modify it and play with it a bit until you find a fit that completes your playstyle because everyone's playstyle is different, the content you're doing is different to the content I'm doing, how you play is different to how I play, and your fit should reflect that. Now I'm going to showcase this fit in action using Bad Hair Day. This is ultimately, I think, comparable to most Tech 10 um, Scout and Inquisitor anomalies, and it was a nice easy way for me just to showcase this, and also I just quite enjoyed the fact that when I did this I had a beautiful teleporting explosion there in the background. Now we're coming up to the fourth wave here in the first section of Bad Hair Days, and I said this is kind of comparable to most Tech 10 content that a player will engage in in Null Sec. Um, if you want to be doing 10, uh, Tier 10 in High Sec and the Encounters, obviously this proves that it's more than doable. Um, heck, if you want to try low second counter running, obviously be aware of people scanning you down. Um, the the Hyperion will handle um, things like an interceptor jumping in on you. It obviously will not handle an entire fleet jumping in on you. So just be careful and be aware if that's what you're going for. Now you'll see that this first load of waves, the first three waves here of Bad Hair Day Part 1, I have been quite comfortable um, running these. I'm still sitting at full 100% armor and full 100% hull with an active armor tank. In the background, I've got the two red um, adaptive armor hardeners running, and I have a single armor repairer running, and that's kept me more than comfortably alive. I don't think I've dropped below 90% armor um, for those first three waves. Now, things are about to change here in the fourth and final wave, and I do completely mess this up with player error, but I thought I'd keep that in and actually showcase what went wrong and how that even though I completely messed it up, the Hyperion actually is quite comfortable still handling that. So this fourth and final wave uh, spawns in with an elite pithy manticore, two of them in fact, and an elite pithy raven, and these are some pretty hard-hitting ships. Now instantly, I go through and I start locking onto the first elite pithy uh, manticore there. I only put one web on to begin with, and then decide that actually, yes, it's an elite, it probably does warrant that second web, and you'll see it goes down pretty quickly. I then start to take on things like the other pithy manticore, uh, manticores here because, well, I'd rather get rid of the little frigates and things that are traditionally harder to hit for a battleship. But remember, I have that NCO Serpentis uh, nanocore going, so my webifiers are at 77% reduction or 71% reduction in speed, whichever it was. Now I then decide that actually, okay, perhaps that second elite pithy manticore is something I should be taking out quickly. Um, we're gonna orbit the Raven. I'm gonna put my uh, put my Nosferatus into effect on that because it's gonna be one of the last ships that I take out, or at least that's what my head is saying. It's the big battleship. They're what I go for large, uh, last. And then I stop and go, oh, hang on a second. Well, maybe actually I'm taking quite a bit of damage here. Perhaps I should be firing instead at the Elite Pithy Raven, and this is very much the wrong thing for me to do. Because that Elite Pithy Raven has a lot 
of EHP. It's going to take a lot of killing to actually bring it down. You can see even with the monstrous DPS here um, that this uh, Hyperion is able to kick out. I'm just not going to cut this down anytime soon and the sheer size of the fleet around it is cutting through my armor slowly but surely. Even with both armor repairers running, I'm not quite keeping up with the damage coming in. What I should be doing at this point is going through some of the middle ships, the cruisers and the battle cruisers, and dropping them out of this situation so that I'm massively reducing the amount of incoming damage. And it takes me quite a long time to actually click and think of this and go, oh, hang on a second, I am taking perhaps more damage than I should. And you see me here now swap across to that Pythum Caracal because, okay, it's not doing as much damage as that battleship is, but the time it's going to take me to take out that battleship is a time I'm taking a lot of additional damage and not reducing it. That damage, that total fleet damage is only going to go down when I take that Raven out and that's a long way off. So I'm going to get rid of that Caracal, then I spot a Blackbird and right, let's get rid of the Blackbird as well because that's going to be doing some damage. Let's thin the herd. And this is an important strategy for something like this. If you're taking a lot of damage, it can be tempting to go for the thing that is dealing the most damage to you. But ultimately, I know that that Elite Pithy Raven is not doing enough damage to out-DPS the two armor repairers. If it was just me and that Elite Pithy Raven, those two armor repairers are going to be more than capable of handling it. So I'd rather get rid of the easier targets that are pushing the total damage over what I can handle. And you see that now that I've started actually hammering those down, the incoming damage is slowing down. I'm not taking as much anymore. It's still more than my armor repairers can handle, but they're doing it. It's slowing down. And the hope here is that actually it's slowing down enough that I'm not going to push into hull, into structure. And it's kind of weird because you'll see in a minute I sort of do, I take 2% hull damage, I go down to 98% hull, despite the fact that my armor is never actually depleted, so I'm not entirely sure what went wrong there, if that's a visual bug somewhere, or if it's, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure is the point, but technically I don't ever lose my armor tank. Um, the two armor repairers are enough to cope with this thanks to the Hyperion's bonuses. And again, if you are worried about this kind of content, then just swap one of those burst aerators for another uh, Trimark armor pump. The thing that is going to allow you to, you know, get even more EHP per cycle, more armor repair per cycle, because it's going to make that single repairer absolutely monstrous, and the second uh, repairer is going to be just, you know, absolute overkill to most incoming damage. It's tempting almost to think about going for something like one of the ones that, that one of the rigs that would reduce the amount of capacitor required. But as you can see, I'm really not losing all that much capacitor, and that's with a draining effect on the ship currently as well. I'm still qu quite comfortably sitting at 60% capacitor here, um, and I've still got the battery. I haven't even been touching the battery at this point, which is why I say perhaps my worry about using the battery might be overkill. And that's up to you. If you decide that actually you want to play it a little less safe, you can comfortably swap the battery, as I said, for a weapon upgrade module or something else entirely, just to give yourself a little bit of extra effect. I have seen people even swap that out for something like an aura warp stab, just in case they get jumped. Although again I don't really recommend that but yeah it's up to you it's depending on what kind of content you're doing and what your most what your biggest threats are around you as uh, as was said by Chris Haddonfield Chris Hadfield can never remember and um, the astronaut sweat the small stuff figure out what's going to kill you first and deal with that first um, and yeah that's kind of what we're getting on here um, but again herd mentality getting thinning that herd really helps the ship survive but well, we're coming to the end of the wave now, and you can see that the armor repairs are stabilizing the amount of damage to my armor. That is now sort of stable, and it's going to be coming back up very, very soon. I've thinned the herd. The amount of damage I'm taking no longer exceeds the amount of damage I'm capable of repairing. The Hyperion's bonuses to armor repairers are keeping it alive, and just the damage this thing can dish out is truly monstrous, and this is just using a standard setup without the bonuses from the... Uh, from the nano core without using a striker. Now, look, when it comes down to it, if you are looking for the best ships for ratting, I still think that the Dominic's 2 or the Armageddon 2 um, do beat the uh, do beat the Hyperion here. You're going to be able to clear more content easier with less risk and possibly even faster. Um, certainly as well, the Apocalypse Striker, that is the absolute queen of ratting at the moment. So the Hyperion doesn't stand up to the Apocalypse Striker. 
um, in regards to ratting in how fast you can clear anomalies and content on your own, but that is a higher risk fit. And if you like the look of the Hyperion, if this is a ship you're interested in, if you want to be using railguns, if you like the look of this ship and you don't want to be flying the giant space you know what, um, the Apocalypse, then it is a great alternative and it's certainly a viable ship. I would also argue as well that the Apocalypse is a bit more of a glass cannon. If someone jumps in on you with a couple of interceptors, like say three interceptors enter your system, the Apocalypse Striker is probably not going to survive that for long. Um, it's going to get jumped, it's going to get scrammed, it's not going to be able to take those out comfortably, whereas here the Hyperion will. It'll tank through that damage quite comfortably um, and it will actually be able to web and destroy those guys if they don't run away because obviously there's nothing here to hold them in place but that's beside the point. So the Hyperion, ultimately I like it. I think it is definitely a good ship. It might not be the best option out there but if you just worry about flying the best in EVE are you even really playing the game? Chasing a meta is not particularly fun in my opinion. I think flying a ship that you enjoy, a ship that you like the look of, a ship that you know fulfills sort of the playstyle that you enjoy I couldn't sit in an Apocalypse Striker and sort of do a sniping from 100 kilometers playstyle. I would be bored stupid. That's why I fly a Typhoon um, that allows me to sort of just orbit and cycle and have fun watching it there um, and doing that. The Hyperion, if I was a railgun player, this would be an excellent option for me because it's something I can brawl with, it's something I can get up in their face with, and I like the look of it and its appearance. Anyway, folks, that's the Hyperion. That's my thoughts and opinions on this ship. Please do let me know yours in the comment section down below, and I'd love to hear what other ships you'd like to see me cover in future. I do also apologize for the quality of the audio. Um, my new mic is giving up the ghost completely, so I've had to go back to the old one, which is, yeah, not as high quality and causes a few other issues elsewhere. Anyway, folks, thanks for bearing with me. Thanks for listening to this one right the way through to the end. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.